Let me introduce Jennifer Beckage. She's a partner at Phillips Lyle in Buffalo. And involved practice is on complex business disputes and commercial litigation. And you can read all this in the, uh, the booklet, which has all the bios in it. But for our purposes, she has extensive experience with a variety of technology-related issues, including data breaches, e-discovery, computer forensics, crisis planning, and data policies, and social media. She's authored and presented all over the place. And with her will be Brandon Lillis. Brandon is an associate of Phillips Lytle, and he practices in all areas of intellectual property law. Um, they, he doesn't study me, so that's why he's good at this. Uh, patent preparation, he's got a degree in computer engineering, which puts him in a status of which I can't even contemplate. Uh, in, in a prior life, was also a patent examiner. So they'll be doing the, the first section. So thank you, Jennifer and Brandon. Thank you. Again. Thanks so much. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Greg mentioned, I'm Jen Beckage from Phillips Seidel. I thought a little background, probably for Brendan and myself, um, and our sort of past careers might be helpful. Uh, before becoming an attorney, I used to own a technology company in western New York. So this was in the late 90s before most people were online. Um, today, anyone can post something online. You can take a picture of yourself with your kids. You can talk about a recent news article. You can put it online. Um, if we can all go back, you know, 20 years, um, no one could do that unless you knew some sort of code. So, and that's when my company was involved. We were, you know, right in that uh, first stages of, you know, online shopping, of, you know, web branded email, of websites, um, you know, content management systems. So it was a really exciting time. And um, after that, we were purchased by a large telecommunications company. They retained me on as vice president of operations for a couple years. I oversaw all of their um, operations for their e-services. Um, um, for about 11 states. And then after that, I decided to go to law school and become an attorney. And I would try to leverage all of that technology experience, which is the same concepts, the same ideas, even though time has changed, you know, the same core competen competencies are there. Um, and I try to leverage those in my, my legal profession and technology disputes. I do anything from, you know, a variety of e-discovery issues to handling uh, technology issues such as data breaches. Um, disloyal employees stealing confidential information. Uh, basically, if you plug it in, <laughs> I'm involved. Uh, whether someone's taking uh, servers hostage, whatever it might be, um, you know, we've been involved in those sorts of matters. So that's a little bit of my background. And uh, Brendan, maybe you can talk a little bit about yourself as well. Sure. Um, name is Brendan Willis. Uh, I have to pop it up a little. Good. There we go. Um, uh, so I have a uh, computer engineering background, a uh, degree from Syracuse. Um, I went to law school at UB. Uh, I went right to work for a small law firm uh, in the city of Buffalo. And there, you know, being a small law firm and myself having a tech background, I kind of doubled as both an attorney and an IT support person. Um, so I got some of that, you know, uh, on the ground experience uh, dealing with, you know, some of these first layer issues that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, from there, I went to work uh, as a patent examiner at the uh, USPTO. Uh, I examined uh, patent applications in the field of computer memory. Uh, so we dealt with a lot of uh, security and encryption issues, um, you know, really the ground level meat and potatoes type stuff of what companies are doing to really try and protect their data. Uh, so we got some good experience there. And then I've been with Philip Slido now about six months and um, you know, do a lot of patent prosecution, but also a lot of uh, data privacy, data protection, uh, those types of policies. We're seeing a lot of uh, need in the marketplace for, for these types of issues, and hopefully we'll be able to shed some light on that today. Yep, great. So we're going to um, talk about a lot of different things today, and maybe what we'll do, usually I don't do this, but maybe we'll try to hold all the questions till the end, because I, I'm pretty confident and hopeful that we'll address all of those questions um, during the presentation. If not, we can take questions at the end. So I just wanted to give real quick an overview of what we're going to talk about. First, we're going to talk about the landscape of data breaches, cybersecurity issues, data privacy issues. We're going to go through some definitional terms, so some things that you might be hearing on the news. What does that really mean? And, and I understand that everyone in the audience has different levels of expertise and experience. So, you know, at some points, you know, if you need to check out for a little bit, we understand. Um, 
And then um, we'll talk about the vulnerabilities of a business and the law firm in today's age. You know, where are those areas where you're going to get hit? Um, obligations, exposure to the business if you have some sort of noncompliance or if there is a breach of some sort. And then lastly, what can you do? The most important takeaways from the, um, the presentation. So let's talk about the current landscape. We've all read the recent headlines. No one is safe. You know, it started off with Target and Home Depot and credit card information uh, being at risk and, you know, um, JP Morgan, the financial institutions, the Panama Papers, we've been reading all over the news about the law firms that are being hacked. Um, you know, a lot of them are the larger law firms dealing with international issues, dealing with, um, you know, the, the big Wall Street bank clients and, you know, but no one's safe. Uh, the celebrities aren't, the Apple iPhone hacking, uh, Sony emails. Um, Ashley Madison, uh, you know, it's a wide variety. And it really comes down to the, the data and who, you know, how valuable is that data and it's valuable to different people for different reasons. Um, as, you know, I just mentioned in going through some of the different industries, there's no one industry that's really insulated. And despite some of these incredibly large organizations that you know are spending a lot of money on security, uh, you know, they're still getting hacked. And why? Um, you know, I know people that are hired to attempt to hack into businesses and, you know, and, and talking to them and understanding, you know, their knowledge of the industry, some hackers do it for fun. They just want to see how good they are and, and they're not actually looking to take anything, they just want to see if they can do it. Um, it's an experiment for them. Um, you know, there is a cyber terrorism element to it as well. And then there's also people that are doing it as an organized crime, you know, trying to get some sort of money and extort the company. Lots of information is at risk, which I talked about already a little bit, and it's an international issue. We've been talking about data breaches for a while. Back in 2013, um, the president had issued an executive order sort of calling for the public and the private to come together to talk about how we can protect ourselves. And, you know, during that same year, the Euro European Union proposed a directive that a couple years later um, became the uh, Network Information Security Directive. And in that, again, it's trying to take the public and the private. How can we work together to come up with best practices and standards and collaborate to develop, um, you know, these steps so that we can try to prevent hackers? And, you know, the laws, they're changing constantly. They're different. Even in the U.S., they're different state by state. The requirements for how to protect that information, what to do in a situation if there is a breach, and we'll go through some of those in a little bit. And, um, you know, probably some, another point that I'd make as well, and then I'll turn it over to you to talk about some of the definitional terms is, I don't know about everyone in the audience, but people are making requests. Your clients are requesting. What are you doing to protect my information? And if you haven't gotten those requests yet, you will. So people are starting to ask the right questions right now, and we're really seeing an uptick in that. Mm -hmm. Anything else about the general landscape? Yeah, I, I think uh, speaking to this specific audience, I know we have a lot of lawyers in the room. Uh, law firms are a specific target at the moment, um, be, is primarily because of the wide range of data that law firms house. So this is not only you know corporate transactional data, merger acquisition information that might be very valuable to an insider trading type situation, but also personal data, uh, social security numbers, bank account information of your clients. You know, law firms are kind of central houses for all of that information and makes them prime targets. Great. So let's. Uh, Hop over to the next one. Just to make sure we're all on the same page here, let's talk about definitions a little bit. Uh, these are a lot of terms that you'll see banding about in the news. And you know, let's make sure everyone's on the same page and knows you know, kind of what we mean when we say these things. So the cloud, what is the cloud? The cloud is basically network storage. So you store something on your computer. When you save a file, it goes to your hard drive. Or you store something on Dropbox, for instance, or in your email account as an attachment. That's all stored on the cloud. That's stored on a hard drive, most likely somewhere that's not your computer, somewhere outside of your office. Okay. Now, why do we need to be careful about cloud storage when we're talking about data security, and especially when we're talking about uh, 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 things like Dropbox, for instance, is a very popular one nowadays. Now, Dropbox is great for storing and sharing family photos, 
But when we're dealing with confidential client information, there's, there's limited resources that Dropbox offers to an IT support staff that can help you in the event of a data breach. Uh, they offer very limited data encryption capabilities. They offer very limited methods of setting permission levels of access. They offer very limited abilities to audit and even become aware of who downloads, who has accessed, uh, who might have breached those files in that cloud storage network. And that's one of the reasons why we want to be very careful in using cloud storage, especially unencrypted cloud storage and unsecured cloud storage with confidential client information. Now, encryption. You know, we hear that banding about all the time as well in the news a lot, especially with the Apple iPhone case. What is encryption? You can think about it as a way of locking the information such that only the key can open it. So whoever has that key can get access to that information. So that was the whole thing with uh, the Apple iPhone case. Uh, the uh, uh, dead terrorist is the only one that had the key, and no one else did. So the government was not able to access that information. And it's a very interesting debate that we have going on right now uh, between you know, private security and encryption and the government, because you know, it, there's, there's obviously a need for governments to be able to access information at some point, but at the same time, by creating the so-called master key or a backdoor you'll often hear banding about, it does weaken encryption uh, upon which a lot of uh, e-commerce and banking and all that is based. So it's a very tough, delicate issue right now. And it basically, if you can envision, it takes your email, so instead of the word, you know, hi, Brendan, um, instead of the H and the I and the space and the B, it will take that text and will change it into a bunch of gog gobbledygook. That's a legal term. Um, it will change it into that and then it will send it to him and then he can't change it back into the H and the I and the space and the B until he's got, you know, the, the key on his side. It's sort of, um, I'm thinking of uh, the 13 year old in my house and the pig Latin they use, right, when the kids are talking to each other, um, you know, so that they can talk about cool things, you know, without us eavesdropping. But, um, so it's kind of that. It's just a way for us to send messages and if someone was to trans, you know, cut into that transmission, they can't read that message unless they know the code. That's absolutely correct. Um, so, uh, where are some methods that uh, these hackers, these uh, nefarious people are using these days to uh, get into our systems? Spam is still the number one preferred method that people use to get in. Now, you know, everyone knows, I think, what spam is for the most part. This is unsolicited email that comes in various forms, shapes, and sizes. Uh, much of it gets caught, hopefully, by a spam filter on an email system that you have, but a lot of it does not. And some of the methods that these people are using are becoming more and more sophisticated uh, as time goes on. Now, phishing is one of the most popular examples. Um, you see it, you know, it's almost ubiquitous now. Uh, you know, this used to take the form of, you know, a, a poorly written, um, you know, plea to, you know, wire five million dollars to my African prince account. Um, you know, those were easily identified and easily deleted. Uh, that's not the case anymore. Uh, these are becoming much more sophisticated. Uh, they, you know, they, are, they are being proofread for spelling errors. Um, they are being directed specifically to individuals. And, no. and this just happened yesterday. You know, I don't know if this was a phishing attempt, but um, it seems suspicious to me. I re received a, 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 an award for something, and I, I received an email saying, oh, Jen Beckage, congratulations on da 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 You know, please click this link to go update your profile. And the email address from where it was sent wasn't the same organization um, that I should have been receiving the award from. So it just seemed a little, you know, and maybe they did have a third-party vendor that was doing that sort of service for them. But you know what? I'm not going to click on it. If they want my updated information, I'll have them call me. <laughs> so I, you know, I just want to be extra careful in all those situations. You have to be extra careful because it's so hard to tell. Um, not only can these messages be targeted and directed uh, based on stuff that people read in the news or people gleam off your public social media accounts or off public websites, your work websites, it's able, you're able to find out a lot of information about someone that you're able to then tailor an email that looks like it's directed from someone they know or you know from some organization that they're affiliated with and get them to click on a link which is normally going to open up you know some kind of malware on their machine and uh, and, and then they're, they're you know they're on the road from there um, another uh, technique that these people like to, to use in these phishing emails is called spoofing and 
what spoofing is is basically uh, making it seem like the email or the link or the website is coming from someone you trust when it really isn't. So some examples. If I might get an email from Jen Beckett at Phillips Lytle, but I notice that Phillips Lytle is only spelled with one L and not two Ls. That's an example of spoofing, you know, common misspellings or things you wouldn't re readily identify. Uh, another method of, of, of spoofing that people use in emails is, is called masking. Um, this will make it appear like an email is coming from a legitimate source, but if you hover your mouse over the link of the email address, you'll find the true email address, which will be something very different, uh, uh, hidden behind the, the masked text that shows up in your email. So it, it can be very difficult to identify these, but it, it just goes to show how careful now you have to be, your methods have to be, how your employees have to be trained to be able to identify this type of thing. Because what we ultimately want to prevent is malware. So malware is just a general definition that we give to basically any type of nefarious software that can include computer viruses, that can include key logging software, that can include spyware, that can include ransomware. Um, these are all kind of uh, subsets of this nefarious type of software that we define as malware. Um, you know, some of the things that the software is capable of is logging your keystrokes and sending everything you type back to someone else, uh, you know, some third party. Um, there's viruses that can be set up to destroy certain data. A uh, very popular one in the news these days is ransomware. That's where uh, 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 a piece of malware will encrypt all of your files on your computer and they will not give you the key unless you wire them X amount of dollars. You know, Sometimes it's $500. Right. It's $1,500. It's a real <laughs> small amount and so the organization is, you know, tied like, I'll just pay it because I, I'm completely shut down. I'm paralyzed. I cannot work. You know, and uh, government officials will probably tell you, look, we really don't want anyone paying anything because we're now just, you know, we're, we're letting them know it's okay and, and, and everyone can just pay any time they feel this, you know, this breach is happening. We're going to give you some tips as we get through um, on how to help prevent that. But that's mm -hmm. one of the most common ways right now. If you're reading about breaches in the news, mm -hmm. a lot of it is probably ransomware. Yeah, I think we just saw a hospital in California pay out $15,000 in Los Angeles to recover cover all their data just because they couldn't afford to have the downtime. They didn't have proper data protection and data backup policies in place. This was all they had. Was their, their entire system was lost. And no one's really looking for the data. They're just looking to paralyze you so they can get some cash. <laughs> That's right. Uh, another term that we'll touch upon real quick uh, that you hear banding about that's misused a lot is called the, the dark web. Um, now, what is the dark web? Uh, also often gets confused with another term called the deep web, which is a little more comprehensive. Uh, basically encompasses all websites that are not indexed by a search engine, um, which is a, a good majority of the internet. But not all deep web stuff is bad. Uh, not all dark web stuff is bad. Um, but basically, uh, uh, the, the true dark web uh, are websites that require special software in order to access, uh, special web browsers. You can't just use Internet Explorer to access them. You can't search them on Google. Uh, but if you know the address, you can go to these places and, and, and uh, it is on these websites, these hidden websites, where you have marketplaces and forums and things like that set up where people trade in this information. You can go on there and buy a piece of ransomware software. You can go on and buy and sell some of the information that people steal in these data breaches. That's where these transactions generally occur. Okay, so let's talk about, and we did a little bit in going through the definition, some of the vulnerabilities of a business or a law firm. Um, number one is your employees. Number one is your employees. Either, you know, not unintentional, I mean, it's just they're making mistakes because they're clicking on those, those email addresses and they're launching, you know, these systems on their computer. They just don't know. Um, and it's not even just the computer access. Maybe it's taking a phone call and, and, and answering questions to someone who they don't know on the other side. You know, who's in charge of your finances? Now they give a name. So now that person knows who to target by reviewing social uh, media sites to find out things about them. Um, you've got to train your employees to be wary of these things. Um, you know, then you've got the bad employee. 
So, and, and we have a lot of matters. Um, this is when I'm running a court to get a temporary restraining order because, you know, we've got a bad employee who's downloaded, you know, the, the confidential uh, customer list on their thumb drive and have left, you know, they've left the building or they've set up a competing business. And now we're running a court to try to prevent them from using it, prevent them from copying it, prevent them from disseminating that to further people. Um, you know, and this is why it's important when you have exit interviews with employees to make sure you're getting all of that information back. Your IT folks should be monitoring if they're noticing before someone leaves, there's a lot of emails being sent to that individual's Gmail account or personal account. They're probably downloading things from the computer system and sending it to themselves so they can save it at home. Same thing if you're noticing a lot of, you know, thumb drive access, a lot of downloads over to uh, uh, removable storage devices. Transfer of data. Here's another vulnerability, and you mentioned Dropbox. And I think if we could do like a little picture with like an X through it with Dropbox behind it, um, for confidential information, we would. We, we just really don't recommend it for all the reasons you stated. Um, you know, it's just probably not the most secure method, but I know a lot of attorneys, a lot of businesses use Dropbox, but it, you're better off using, you know, a secure FTP site. If you have to use removable devices, you can buy hard drives, you can buy small removable storage devices that have encryption codes on them, you know, spend the extra little bit of money and purchase those. We talked about cloud storage, you know, like Dropbox, uh, Google Drive. Again, it's not private. You don't know maybe what the vendor's doing with that information. Are they using it for advertising purposes or something else? Mobile devices is another one. Um, be careful at airports where you're plugging your device into. You know, you're running low on your battery. You see that vending machine, it looks like, and you can kind of plug your phone into it. I don't know this business. I don't know who's on the other side. Once I plug it in, are they downloading something else? You know, be careful about what you're doing with your phone and, and who's using that phone. Um, I'll give an example. I had a um, meeting in our uh, New York City office and we were dealing with some confidential documents and uh, someone's legal assistant was there and I said we were talking about a secure method for me to transfer this document to them. And she's, oh, no problem, I'll just take a picture of it right now. You know, on her personal iPhone, I know nothing about this woman, you know, what she's going to do with it. Is she then going to email it from here to some, someone else? And then if she deletes it off the phone, is it really deleted? You know, what if her phone's stolen? Does she have password protection on her phone? I mean, these are all the sorts of things that you have to think about. Um, and, and it's a vulnerability for the business you know, knowing that people nowadays can just take pictures. They can just take pictures. You know, you have someone coming in to do a tour of your plant, a tour of your office. They can walk through and take pictures of documents and then blow it up right then on their phone. And, you know, they see who it's to and from. I've seen people post on social media pictures of them at their desk. And I love it. I can zoom in. Oh, I can see all the papers on their desk, the clients that they're working for, um, the screen in the background on their computer, what files they're working on. So you have to talk to your employees. You have to make sure that they're being careful. Internet access. You should be using, um, you know, some sort of secure method to get into your network, like VPN, instead of just using public Wi-Fi. Another thing is to, you know, Companies and law firms may not know where all their data is located. So an example I'll give is when law firms are doing document reviews or clients are doing document reviews in a litigation, if you're using an external um, contract team to review those documents, are they reviewing those documents, you know, in a foreign country or are they reviewing them in the U.S.? And that may make a difference. If your client is regulated and those documents are not supposed to be overseas, you've got a problem. So ask questions, try to figure out where your, where your data is. And then the last thing is social media. Again, it's a vulnerability of the business for all the reasons I gave. Um, and, and to talk about real quick, social engineering and phishing scams. Sometimes when you're setting up um, an account and you forget your password, it'll say things like, where did you go to high school? Well, if on your Facebook account it has your high school, well, that's an easy question to answer. What's the name of your favorite pet? Go to their website. You can find out. I love, you know, Cookie. My dog Cookie. He's my favorite. Okay. Now I can enter that in and now I can create a new password and I'm in. So we have to be careful about our social media sites. 
Yeah, I believe that's how uh, the latest hacker says he got into Hillary Clinton's email server was uh, through that social engineering method. Uh, one of her assistants, he went online, found out all this information about him, figured out the answers to his uh, password reset questions, and now he's in. That's it. So let's go on to talk about some of the obligations that we have as attorneys and even as uh, business people in the community. Obligations are going to be those placed upon us both legally uh, by uh, you know, statutes, state, federal, or ethics statutes, uh, and also uh, by our customers. You know, customers are going to demand that you know, we have some level of accountability because many times they are required by law to make sure that their third-party vendors abide by these standards. Okay? Uh, so we have to be careful about which state in this country and which country uh, that is we are operating in because the laws are going to vary state to state. I know California in particular has some very comprehensive data breach policy notification laws that are in place right now. I believe Nebraska and Tennessee just enacted in the past couple of weeks new notification laws where if you have customers that have data breach, uh, they have uh, data that's been breached uh, from residents of those states, then the attorney general has to be notified. Uh, the customers have to be notified all within certain time frames. Um, so th this is fast evolving, ever changing, and you know things that we need to be apprised of if we're dealing with customers from multiple areas. Uh, same thing if we're dealing with clients or customers uh, out of the country. Canada has their own laws. Uh, the EU is kind of a mess right now. Um, recently there was a, uh, a provision called the Safe Harbor provision that governed uh, data transfer from, the e from EU residents to the United States for either control or processing. Uh, that, uh, those sets of standards have been uh, deemed insufficient and reversed by the courts in the EU. Uh, they are currently working on uh, new policies called Priv Privacy Shield, but nothing has been finalized yet. Uh, so it's kind of a gray area right now, and the recommendation is to be you know, overprotective of any information that's coming from EU residents. And that may be important if your firm or your business holds information about European residents. You have to know about these standards. Now talking about specific state standards, and this is where we're going to bring in our ethics lesson for the day. We are going to refer to, uh, and I believe part of this is in the materials, uh, New York Rules of Professional Conduct 1.6C is what we're going to be most interested in. And I will read it for you in case you're not there. A lawyer shall, this is a shall clause, exercise reasonable care to prevent the lawyer's employees, associates, and others whose services are utilized by the lawyer from disclosing or using confidential information of a client. So that seems relatively straightforward. Reasonable care. Now what is reasonable care? That's the million dollar question. For some guidance on that, we are going to look to a couple of opinions that uh, the state has issued in addition to some comments that the Bar Association has made on Rule 1.6. Specifically, if we look to the duty to preserve confidentiality, comment number 17, I believe is a couple pages after uh, in your materials on uh, uh, the 1.6 rule. It says, when transmitting a communication that includes information relating to, re to the representation of a client, the lawyer must take reasonable precautions to prevent the information from coming into the hands of unintended recipients. This duty does not require the lawyer to use special security measures if the method of communication affords a reasonable expectation of privacy. Does unencrypted email afford a reasonable expectation of privacy? Some people may say yes, some people may say no, some people may say, well, it depends on how sensitive the information is. We'll touch upon that a little bit more in a minute. Special circumstances may warrant special precautions. Factors to be considered in determining the, determining the reasonableness of the lawyer's expectation of confidentiality include the sensitivity of the information and the extent to which the privacy of the communication is protected by law or confidentiality agreement. The client may require the lawyer to use a means of communication not required by the rule or may give informed consent to the use of means or measures that will otherwise be prohibited. So in, in reading that rule earlier I said, you know, we really would suggest maybe not using Dropbox. 
if, if I'm an attorney and maybe I've only have a, a couple of attorneys in my office and we use Dropbox and we use it with our clients and opposing counsel, if we're transmitting information that the client otherwise, it, you know, would disseminate in the public, um, you know, it, it, the, the, so you mentioned the sensitivity of inf information. So, you know, it, it, it's not containing social security numbers. It's not containing, you know, the trade secret formula. You know, is Dropbox maybe okay in that instance? Might be okay in that instance. At the same time, if any of that information is included, if we're dealing with a sensitive merger and acquisition, uh, where their public knowledge might affect insider trading rules, um, then if we're going to use Dropbox, um, we should probably obtain consent from the client. And that consent from the client should include a statement to the effect of the risks of the system, that being Dropbox, do not provide reasonable assurances of confidentiality. That is in order to make sure that the client is informed of the risk of using those types of tools for transfer of data. Uh, some other uh, comments that the uh, New York State Bar Association in Ethics Opinion 1019 has uh, uh, discussed to try and illustrate what constitutes reasonable measures. Uh, they have some examples here. What is reasonable care? Well, for instance, when we're referring to something like Dropbox, ensuring that the online data storage provider has an enforceable obligation to preserve confidentiality and security, and that the provider will notify the lawyer if served with process requiring the production of information. Uh, employing available technology to guard against foreseeable attempts to infiltrate the data that is stored. I don't know how many people have read through the data protection and the data privacy policies and the terms of service of Dropbox, but you may want to if you're going to be using it, especially if you're going to be storing any kind of confidential information on there. And the same goes for your web-based email accounts. Usually they have the same sorts of terms and conditions saying you really don't have an expectation of privacy. They at any time can go through your emails or, or your data. There's one further caveat here that uh, 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 the Ethics Opinion Board has commented on, and that is roping in Rule 1.1, which is not in the materials, into Rule 1.6, and that is that there's a requirement of competence to determine and follow a set of steps that constitute reasonable care. So what does that mean? That means that if we are going to use Dropbox, not only do we have to be aware of the risks, not only do we have to inform the client and obtain consent if we're going to be storing confidential information there, but we also must be competent in this area. So if half of what we're talking about here is gibberish and it you know, doesn't make any sense, you can't make heads or tails of this, well then this is something that you need to be extra careful about. Either have a support team on staff to train you and your employees about this type of information or stay away from it altogether. You know, you use paper, use the mail, use more secure methods than online storage. Okay. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the ethical obligations as we go through the rest of the presentation. Um, so, and, and maybe I'll just real quick to touch real quick on the reporting obligations. I think you mentioned the state laws vary as far as reporting obligations if there is a breach um, as far as to the individuals. Generally look at, you know, the data that was taken that really will tell you, you know, what kind of information is uh, taken will impact, you know, what laws will govern. So if it's financial information, you know, maybe you have to look at the SEC. If it's health information, maybe you have to look at HIPAA and high tech. Um, and, you know, look at all the, the government agencies that may need to be notified. Again, this is, and there's short time frames. Some places require 30 days notice. Some require 45 days notice. So, uh, and there's a lot happening, but that's a very short window of time to figure out what exactly happened, get notice out to people, and, and respond. Um, exposure to the business. You know, I think a lot of this doesn't really have to be stated, but, you know, uh, briefly, because I'd like us to get to all the things that you can do to help protect yourself, is, you know, the reputational harm. It, you're, you know, no one wants to be in, in the media for that. And, you know, your, your competitors will definitely latch on to it. The other thing is, you know, the exposure to class actions and other litigation. There's a lot of copycat class actions going on now um, for these individuals. Um, you know, bringing negligence, state consumer protection claims, breach of contract claims. Obviously, there's a lot of issues and hurdles that they face regarding, uh, you know, being able to show causation and, and injury. And, you know, then you, besides the litigation piece, you also have these investigations by these, you know, federal and state agencies into what happened. So it, it's, uh, um, and, you know, those are the situations where you may never find out who did the breach. 
where you've got a hacker and you don't, you don't even know who it is. Um, then you've got the situation where you have a data breach by, let's say, a former employee or by a competitor and you can find out who they are. So now you're can maybe commencing an action against them. And again, maybe you're in that situation where you're seeking a temporary restraining order, you're running to court. Again, a lot of this is money, a lot of time, and a lot of business disruption. You know, as we talked about uh, ransomware paralyzing your business, and that's why data backup is really, really important because if you have everything backed up, and backed up separate from your network, so not a backup that's still connected to your network, but a backup that's completely separate from your network. So envision, I'm going to put everything that I have about this business on this hard drive, and I'm going to go unplug it and lock it over here. If you have a ransom attack and they do paralyze the business, while you're dealing with that, you can load everything up and you can still operate your business. The most that you've lost is maybe that day's worth of work. So, so that's a, um, probably, I think encryption and, and backup is probably the two big takeaways you'll, you'll hear today. So let's get into, while we've got about um, 20 minutes left in the presentation, you know, the things that you can do. What can you do when you leave today? Okay, let's start with some of our uh, overarching high level, uh, we call this the network level access. And, and these are going to be all of our entry points into the system, uh, whether that is uh, internally within a building, how we log in to our computers online, or whether that's remote access, whether that's you know, obtaining email on a mobile phone. Uh, the control of this high level of entry into the system needs to be you know, maintain, needs to be secure, uh, needs to be handled by someone that knows what they're doing. Um, you know, it, it, at, at the uh, highest level of uh, obtaining internet into our building, you know, we have uh, a cable line or a fiber optic line coming in to a modem and that gets routed to routers or switches. Um, you know, very base level, have the passwords been changed for that equipment? You know, I don't know how many big data breaches have occurred because people have purchased hardware off the shelf that comes with a default username and password, and they just leave it. And, and, and hackers, I mean, they, they, it couldn't be any easier for them. Are you saying people are still using 123? 123, password, password, uh, admin, password. Uh, the, you know, the, there's maybe a dozen combinations that will be the first thing that a hacker might try. Um, and it's, it's almost you know, ubiquitous throughout the industry that, that there are people you know, that have not taken the, the most basic reasonable steps, let alone you know, a comprehensive suite of steps, which is recommended. Um, if we are allowing remote access, we touched upon that a little bit, um, uh, are, are we requiring a VPN to, in order to log into the system? Are we allowing people to log in from public Wi-Fi, for instance? Can, can someone go to a coffee shop you can go to Starbucks and log into your work computer. It's probably not a good idea. You should probably have a data policy that does not allow for that to happen. Um, or built-in measures in place that would detect when someone tries to do that and prevents it. Um, and it's not even, this isn't even just you know, technology related. Some of it's just if you are going to a coffee shop, and I've seen it, I've been at Starbucks, I've been at Tim Hortons, and I'm sitting there, and someone's next to me with their laptop open, and they're on the phone, and I'm hearing all about what they're working on, the customer deal that they're working on, and again, this is why you have to talk to your employees, too, so to make sure that they're not doing those sorts of things. Right. Uh, we talked about uh, data backup and having you know, a, a separate physical uh, backed up hard drive or backed up server, something that's, that's totally uh, separated from our internal network in case something does happen and there's you know, a shutdown. Um, you know, combined with that, we want to make sure that we have backup power uh, in case the power goes out to make sure we don't lose a bunch of valuable information. Is, is this, this hardware, all this network equipment, is it secured in a locked room that only certain people have access to? Or is it just kind of out in the open? Oh, it was convenient because that's where the uh, you know cable box plugs into, and it's right next to Joe's desk. Uh, you know, no, that's not that's not recommended these days. Um, you know, do we have what type of contracts do we have with our uh, 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 
cable and internet providers? You know, is there downtime protection? You know, there, there's a big reason why commercial uh, cable modem accounts and internet access accounts cost so much more than residential, and that's because of the built-in redundancies that are that are in place. It, it it comes down to the level of service that's available in case something does does go down. If it happens at three in the morning on a Saturday, you can call up Verizon and then they'll open a ticket immediately. Uh, that wouldn't be the case if it happened, you know, on your home computer. All these things are important. Um, you know, user access levels. We talked about changing the password on our modem. Well, who has access to do that? Does every employee that logs into your internet system have access, or does only one IT guy and maybe the CEO have, have that password that allows them to gain access and privilege to change those passwords? And these access permissions can be set really across the board in, in, in many different levels. So not only your you know, network hardware and your passwords, but access to certain folders or documents. All these different levels of permissions can be set. Yeah, the person who's answering your phones, do they need access to all of your client files? Probably not. So you can limit those permissions, and it's very simple for IT to do. You just need to let them know. So you should have different levels of access for each of your employees, depending on their role and what they do for the organization. And I think IT guys is the, is the, the main component here because, again, we, you know, when we get to start talking things like firewalls and DMZ servers and border routing, web security gateways, remote access, VPNs, you know, th this can all get highly technical very quickly. And if you don't understand it, well, you need to have someone Someone on staff that does, or at least someone on retainer that does. Uh, so, you know, this is absolutely an area where it might be worth hiring out or hiring a guy that comes and does this full time, because the risks of not doing it in this day and age, especially dealing with the types of information that we're regularly dealing with, it, it's just too great not to do and not to have in place. Do you want to talk about some of the management level stuff, Jen? Sure, sure. So we talked a little bit about it. Um, but you know, generally, this is your, again, your employee training, having the right policies in place. So you know, as, as Brendan mentioned, you know, monitor your remote access. Technology is changing as well, so trying to keep up to date on that. You know, we talk about bring your own devices, and everyone's thinking about iPhones and iPads. You know, what's the next step? Google Glasses, iWatches. You know, what are we doing with that information? How are people capturing things? And do we have the right protections and policies in place? Um, leaving computers on. You know, your phone, your desktop should automatically time out after a certain period of inactivity. And do you have that set up? That way, if someone does come into the building, they don't have that sort of, you know, carte blanche access to all of your files on the computer. Training programs for your employees uh, to talk about these things will be key as you start to roll this out. And again, make sure you have IT involved. Uh, I talked a little bit about bring your own device policies, those you may want to review. Again, exit interviews are going to be really important when employees leave. So understand what they have at home. You know, are, do you have uh, uh, thumb drives? And you know, look, I'm guilty too. I think someone called them the. the cockroaches of removable uh, media because they're everywhere. They're everywhere. I know all of us have a drawer at home that's filled with some thumb drives or laying around on your desk. You know, an attorney or an employee departs from your firm or business and you find a, you know, a CD or a thumb drive, a hard drive, they're unlabeled. You don't know what's on it. Uh, maybe you bring something home and then your kid wants to put a paper on it uh, so they can take it to school and print it and you know they leave it in their locker. What is on these things? Uh, they just go everywhere. So try to avoid them and again if you do use them, you know, try to purchase the ones that have encryption on it. Uh, picking up along those lines too, that was a, a common um, uh, uh, I guess auditing uh, policy that a lot of businesses will do is they will leave thumb drives kind of floating around around the building. And it'll be uh, tagged with a piece of software that will activate as soon as you plug the thumb drive in. And you'll see, OK, you know, if you pick up a thumb drive and you don't know what's on it, do not plug it into your computer. Right. <laughs> you know, it, it, these things can have software that self-activate immediately. So that, that's actually an auditing method that a lot of companies use. They'll leave these things laying around the office. Inevitably, someone will plug it in their computer, and then they'll get an immediate alert to the IT staff saying, you know, OK, this person did this. Yeah. And, and 
and to roll back in our, um, you know, the ethical rules, 1.6C says that you have a duty as an attorney to take reasonable care to guard against disclosure of those you know, that are working under your supervision. So you know, this is an ethical responsibility to try to take those best efforts, those reasonable efforts um, to protect this information. Um, we talked about permission, uh, limit user access and uh, the exit interviews. Confidentiality, non-disclosure agreements, you know, do you have those with your employees? Your IT policies, you know, take a look at those. Um, internally, what are your IT policies for record retention and destruction? You know, you don't want to make yourself a target because you have lots of data. Why is everyone storing everything? Why are you storing things past your legal uh, retention requirements? If there's not a legal obligation to hold it or a business need to hold it, dump it. You know, before technology, would you see, save every little piece of paper? Probably not. You'd have banker boxes, right, filling your office. But now we save every little email. Meet you at 4 o'clock. Put that in the Clyde folder. <laughs> well, we, don't, we didn't keep that before. So, you know, don't keep what you don't need to because otherwise you're just creating this big pile of data that may make yourself vulnerable. So review those, you know, record retention policies and review your incident response plans. It's better to do that now instead of, you know, evaluating that in the midst of a crisis. So a big thing is we really want to keep our IT staff, our IT support people, or whoever our IT guy is for the office engaged as we are developing these policies. And because they're going to be the ones that will be able to identify weaknesses and vulnerabilities in a lot of these cases. So for instance, uh, you know, picking up on what Jen's talking about and some more best practices, um, you know, do we have policies in place to update software? So this is not only, you know, the Windows updates that, you know, generally happen automatically when you restart the computer, but software tools that we use. If we're using free versions of software, so Adobe Acrobat Reader, for instance, uh, almost everyone uses to read PDF files, that is notoriously notoriously vulnerable to security threats. And that's why you see uh, updates almost constantly pop up, you know, maybe on a weekly basis for that software. If you just let that sit and you don't update, you are vulnerable. You know, that, that's why these updates come in place. That's what, these, that's what these updates are. These are not, you know, it, it, if you use these programs a lot of people have for years, it, it doesn't look like they've changed over the last 10 years, even though they've had, you know, weekly updates. Well, these updates are behind the scenes, you know, fixing security loopholes that have been identified. Uh, same thing with uh, antivirus software uh, and anti malware software. Um, you know, a, a lot of companies like to use free versions of this software because it can get pricey if you have a lot of computers that are running them. There are free versions that are good. There are free versions that are not so good. Um, if you're going to use free versions, uh, you, you really have to know what you're dealing with. So you need someone experienced to be able to recommend uh, certain programs over other programs because some are better than others. Uh, but you need to have, you know, that level in place. You know, that, that's absolutely a, a key piece. Um, same thing with uh, spam filters and, and web email filters. You know, a lot of people, uh, you know, get used to using, you know, Gmail or Yahoo accounts and they have their spam filters in place. But if now turning over to the business, if they just use Outlook for a business address, they might not have a spam filter in place. If you don't, uh, that, that's, that's a problem. <laughs> you need to have one. Um, and and there, again, there are you know, solutions that are free, there are solutions that are costly, and you know, those all have to be evaluated. Um, and at the same time, we want to make sure that our data backup policies, I'll reinforce this again, are, are just so important because at the end of the day, if something bad does happen and there's a good chance that it will to some extent or the other, uh, you know, being able to minimize and do damage control, minimize the risk and, and, and the fallout um, is just so key and, and having strong data backup policies uh, can go so far to prevent this. And the other thing I want to mention is evaluating the agreements you have with external third parties. So, you know, for the attorneys in the room, that might be your document um, review, review tool provider. Um, that may be your vendor who's doing your printing for a production. Um, you know, for a business, you know, it could be your cloud service provider. Whoever it is, you want to evaluate those contracts. And, and I know you, Brendan, you touched upon that before. But you also want to understand from them not just the steps they're taking to protect the information, but when they're done with the job, are they deleting it like they say they are? 
Did they return it to you? Did they destroy it properly? Did they use the proper destruction methods? Um, you know, maybe check to see if they're, you know, how they compare against other vendors, how they're certified, their practices, have other people complained about it? Um, you know, this is the tricky part is knowing where all your information is at. So evaluate also those, uh, those third party relationships I think is important. Insurance is a key aspect too. Um, not only our, our our insurance providers, uh, one of these companies that are requiring uh, their uh, uh, contractual uh, uh, people to abide by some of these standards, but at the same time, on the flip side, there is now available cyber insurance. You can buy insurance to you know mitigate risk against some of these data breaches, and for you know companies you know that may not have uh, the resources to invest into you know a first class IT team uh, that might be something to look into uh, you know to put on that extra layer of protection if you're more at risk. Yeah, there's so many things to weigh. Um, you know the the nature of your practice and your business. You know, understanding do you think you really are at risk? Um, and, and how much so, and what kind of information you're housing. You know, obviously different industries are gonna be maybe more vulnerable, uh, depending on size, depending on the data that you have. So we're giving a lot of, you know, um, advice and recommendations, but you have to, you know, internalize it and determine what's best for your business, because it's not, you know, a one fit, all sort of plan. Um, take what you can and apply it to your business. Um, I do want to talk a little bit as we're getting cl close to the end of our presentation about you know what we call forensics. And you know forensics in the technology sense is kind of getting under the hood, if you will. And we're going to talk a little bit about getting under the hood um, as it relates to protecting your data, data security, data privacy. So the first thing is you know testing the system, hiring a vendor, and maybe hiring a different vendor every year to go test your system to see where you're vulnerable. And this is more of like an IT analysis. So you, they can do you know, a, a, an attempt at a breach um, to find out where those vulnerabilities are. Metadata, we've all heard metadata. What is it, what does it mean? Um, that's that information behind a document. So if you've got an email, or I'll use a Word document for example. Let's pretend I draft a letter to Brendan and, uh, and you know, it's got my to and from and my ray line and my content. The meta, that's the front page that everyone sees. The metadata in Microsoft Word would be the date that I authored that document. You know, the date and time stamp of when I made any revisions. That's metadata. It's stuff that you don't see up front. So how does that impact all of this? You know, data can be breached at any time. It can be seen at any time. You don't always have to think about the, the hacker, the cyber attack. It can occur at a lot of different levels. And some of it's just this inadvertent disclosure because you don't even know you're disclosing it. And I'll give one example. I think it's been fixed with the later versions of Adobe PDF, but um, if you had a, a, a PDF document and you wanted to make redactions on it and you put a black bar, let's say, over the text that you wanted to redact, if you view it in an older version of Adobe, that person could easily see behind your black box redaction. So you're making a disclosure you don't even know that you're, you're doing. So really, and this is why it, it's scary. It's scary because you don't know all the places. You think you're doing something right and doing a good thing and you don't even realize you're making an inadvertent disclosure. Um, so ask questions and, and that's also why we have things like clawback agreements and, uh, and get that back. Um, documents, you know, when you are getting rid of something, make sure you're taking the right defensible methods to destroy information and data. So, ah, this laptop's old, I'll just throw it in the garbage. No, I would make sure you wipe it, you clean it, maybe even take a hammer and just hit the hard drive a couple times. <laughs> um, you know, you want to really make sure that you're getting that data off properly and correctly. Don't just donate it to a charity. Usually those charities um, will have, thankfully, the methods to make sure things that are wiped off, so make sure they take those steps. Mm -hmm. And again, we talked about not keeping everything. Don't make yourself too vulnerable. But you know, looking under the hood, kind of understanding what's going on behind the scenes and, and all the things that you do, uh, there's, it's changing all the time. It's too much. You know, if we haven't scared you, um, you know, I, I apologize if we have, but you know, we're all always learning too about the new technologies and how it impacts everything. We know how 
fast the technology changes and obviously the laws don't keep up and obviously our IT support in a lot of cases even can't keep up. Um, so you just do the best you can. Uh, you know, we're required to take reasonable steps. We've tried to highlight today what some of those reasonable steps look like. Um, even those are changing and those are becoming more comprehensive you know, as we go on here. Um, so I think in the end, if I had to give like a couple takeaways, it would be data backup and encryption and talk to your employees. Those would probably be my three big things. Data backup, encryption, and talk to your employees. And I, we try to leave a couple minutes left if anyone has any questions about anything. Yes? So how do you actually know if your information has been um, stolen? That's a great, that's what's happening now is you, you may have been hacked and, and don't know. And that's what's happening with most companies. The, the, the hacking event may have occurred a year ago, but you don't know until you have an expert really come in and do an analysis. You know, and you've got to balance this with, you know, there's this sort of, you know, the world's ending, right? Everyone's so scared about these data breaches. You know, these are obviously opportunities for people to come in and, um, and to do these things, but you've got to temper everything. Um, you know, what sorts of transactions are you doing? What do you think is vulnerable? Talk to your IT. Maybe they're already doing these things. But if not, you can get an outside vendor to determine if there's been some sort of an event. In many cases, they're not actually taking anything. They're just poking in. But that's why you need an expert to come in. To, they can make that determination. And that's what's tricky, too, when you then have reporting requirements. So you have to report and give notice, sometimes as early as 30 days, to people whose information has been taken. But you still may be in the process of determining maybe nothing was taken. And this is why we recommend that uh, really everyone have a data breach policy in place uh, because uh, that's what would lay out, I at least from your internal perspective, you, uh, the steps that you would take, that your IT department would take to determine what constitutes a data breach. These are, the, these are what we look for, uh, you know, unauthorized access, you know, uh, what IP addresses are coming in, what parts of the world are they coming in from, what type of data was transferred and when, you know, all of those records uh, can be gleaned by a competent IT staff and, and, and someone with knowledge of access to you know networking in these systems you can you know when we talk about the forensics that's the type of information that you can see the the going in and going out the when and the who um, and, and then combining those into a policy that says okay you know we know that all these people are authorized we saw something over here where a bunch of data went out the door that was not authorized you know that we have to look into that and you know if it was determined that we think there may have been a data breach here, well then here are the sets of steps that we follow. That we follow. So we're going to document exactly when, exactly what we're going to document and with and, counsel. Yes, <laughs> draft letters. You know, to 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 who? You know, to the customers, to the state attorney general, to uh, you know, of every state where this occurred. Any other questions? Yes. For businesses uh, considering a third party CSP, is there a certain So there are several, and there's several competing standards right now, not only for third-party providers of these services, but also uh, certifications that the businesses themselves can get. Um, so I believe like there's uh, you know one of the ISO certifications, I, I can't remember, I think it was 1071, something like that. Yeah. Um, and there's, and uh, uh, there's the NIST uh, offers some uh, uh, security standards. So, there, so there's several that are competing right now, um, because this is so new, everyone's trying to determine, okay, what's comprehensive, uh, what, what is the best. Um, you know, a popular one right now that a lot of people look to is the uh, credit card standard, uh, the PCI payment card industry. If you collect and process payments, um, you're bound by Visa, MasterCard, American Express to abide by a very specific, very comprehensive set of security standards um, that's being used as a model for a lot of places, you know, with regards to, you know, non-financial data, for instance. Um, so, you know, that's a good place to start if you're looking to implement your own policy, but there are several others that are available right now for certification. 
And that's also you know, something that we suggest that businesses look into as a way of differentiating and separating themselves in the marketplace. Because if you can prove that you have this certification, uh, and a lot of that will involve auditing, a lot of that will involve some of these companies coming in, attempting to breach your system, and then making notes that you know, they, they were not able to, or identifying the vulnerabilities. You know, if you can show all that's in place, you know, that might set you ahead in the market. Thank you very much. Thank you guys very much.